Hey everyone, this is George Kroos and welcome back to another monthly episode of the highlights from the past month of the Innovators Mindset podcast. And this is for the month of August, 2023. And what we've done this month is actually compile highlights specifically from the Epic Book Reviews. I had a wonderful opportunity to speak to authors of books that were written prior to 2020 and ask them what's something they would change and what is something that they really think is relevant from their book that was written in the past that's relevant today. And one of the reasons I wanted to do these podcasts was because I think that I hear things like this. Oh, if you're talking about stuff that was prior to COVID, it doesn't work with kids anymore. And I'm sure there's some things, I, I get it, but there's a little bit of recency bias as we're as if we're acting, COVID's the only thing that's ever ha bad that's happened in the world ever in history. And, and here's what I mean by that. If you think about some of the best books written of all time, and one of my favorites is Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And from what I know, I think that was written in the 1930s. And it's one of my favorite books of all time. And think about that book and how it relates to so much of what we know today and what is beneficial today. But that was written prior to World War II. And that's a pretty major event. And so I'm sure many of those ideas still resonated before World War II and after. And that's the thing about some of the best books I've ever read. And it's something as a publisher, I really encourage the authors that I work with to think about, is your message gonna be pertinent 20, 30 years from now? Are you sharing timeless messages and principles or are you just kinda you know, talking about something that's right now? And you see right now a ton of books going out on artificial intelligence. They might be doing how to's, but I guarantee you the time be between when those books were written and and now that they're published, many of the things that they shared have changed. Uh, artificial intelligence, for example, is uh, today as I speak, the worst it's gonna be from this moment forward. It's only gonna get better. There's only gonna be new opportunities. Now, how we embrace new technologies, how we learn from them, that's a totally different concept. But if it's giving you step-by-step -step a book on how to use artificial intelligence, it's gonna be irrelevant by the time it gets published. And so I loved asking this question is, how, how is what you wrote prior to 2020 still relevant today? And I had an awesome opportunity to help promote books from people that I, I know, I appreciate, but I also wanna take a moment to share my book, Innovator's Mindset, and here it is. And I really believe when I wrote it, it there's, the, the concepts are still relevant today. And I've actually had the entire summer, and I'll continue to do so, talking about ideas and obviously always tweaking, always modifying um, from, from the book and from the concepts because I was very clear when I wrote that book, I didn't want this to be something that was a fad. And really, how do we look at innovation and education? And really innovation to me is just about doing new and, and better things. And I actually remember distinctly writing that if I can tell you the step-by-step -step on how to be innovative, it's not innovative at all. And I feel we're kind of facing a leadership crisis in education that we're asking people to be innovative in our organizations, but we're saying, but this is exactly how you do it. We are asking for creativity, but with very type A personalities that want you to do exactly what they want you to do. And I think we gotta kind of find that flexibility. Of course, we have things that we have to ensure that we're taken care of. There's mandates that we have to uh, understand that come from the different governments, whether it's state, provincial, federal, wherever. And I wanted to read this passage from the Innovator's Mindset. And you can get the book down below. I, I also, you know, I've, I wanna make sure you see my book as well as much as I've tried to approach uh, others, others' books. Um, over this time and innovators mindset is my baby that is my baby it's it's something not only that I wrote but it's how I live my life and this is what I wrote in the innovators mindset and it's specifically this as leaders if we ask teachers to use their own time to do anything what we're really telling them it's not important the focus on compliance and implementation of programs in much of today's professional development does not inspire teachers to be creative nor does it foster a culture of innovation. Instead, it forces inspired educators to color outside the lines and even break the rules to create relevant opportunities for their students. 
These outliers form pockets of innovation. Their results surprise us. Their students remember them as great teachers, not because of the test scores they receive, but because the lives were touched. And this is a really important aspect for me when I talk about this. I don't want anyone being innovative and your test score is going down. Uh, the distinction I always make is that you can have kids who are really great test takers who aren't great learners, but if you develop really great learners, they'll be fine on the test. And going beyond knowledge to wisdom, that's a really important aspect for me. When you're thinking about innovation, it's simply doing new and better things and thinking about this differently. And I had this conversation just this past week with a group and saying, do you actually create rules and policies that inhibit educators for doing what's best for kids? that they say, hey, I would really like to do this. And I think it would be really beneficial to the people that I know that are right in front of me, but I can't because it's a rule. Because I either have to choose doing what's best for kid, best for kids or actually following the rule. And as an administrator, one of the things I always said is don't focus on the rules and we're going to get rid of as many of these as possible. All I ask of you is to do what's best for the people you are standing in front of. And that means you need some autonomy. You need some uh, flexibility to do things in a way that works because we always talk about personalizing learning, but then we standardize what that looks like for our teachers, the, our assessments, things like that. So as you listen to these podcasts, these snippets, I want you to kind of keep that idea of the innovator's mindset in the back of your mind. The things that they're sharing are there things that you can actually do in your classrooms, in your schools without breaking the rules. And if you're an administrator listening to this, do you put your people in positions to actually do what's best for kids or to follow the rules? Because it shouldn't be an either or. We need to find ways that we create these cultures of innovation instead of cultures of compliance because we can't ask people to be creative but tell them exactly how to do that because it doesn't really you know, foster that innovation in our schools. So I wanted to share my book uh, and you can see that down the link below but there's a ton of little snippets from other books here as well and i hope that you see the the relevance of these books these ideas in 2023 or 2024 or whenever you're listening to this podcast and beyond and if you ever think about writing if you ever think about creating your own work which i encourage you all to do because i think there's so much that People out here listening, they, they might listen, but they don't share. But everyone listening has something of value to share with the world. Always think about what am I asking of people and how will this be relevant 20, 30 years from now? Because if we're focused more on principles and things that really matter to us, those should be timeless. But if we're focused on fads and technologies, those things will become irrelevant by the time we get those those books published to the world and there's always things we can learn that are new and growing but i think really deep down it's about developing that wisdom not only in our students but ourselves so i hope you enjoyed this month's podcast um, the highlights and i hope that uh, i hear from you some of the books that you've read i hope one of them is mine uh, and i'd love to hear your thoughts but welcome back to another episode of the highlights from the month of the innovators mindset podcast So tell me, what did you do with the stuff I talked about the first time? Like, what did you do? And she's like, well, I said, so you want new stuff? I didn't really do anything with the other stuff. And I think a lot of times, <laughs> like, I think a lot of times people, and we sometimes are worst enemies in education, is that we always want to get the new, new thing, the new thing. And I'm like, we got to do some dig in to get really good at the old thing for too. So like when you were telling that mm -hmm. story, and, you know, I understand the practicality, I know, and I appreciate you sharing that. There's also sometimes you, people are always craving for new, new, new. I'm like, like that's, how about you just kind of focus on, are you really doing the old part really well? Right. It's like, don't complain we're being overwhelmed with initiatives if you're constantly asking for new initiatives. Because, yeah. like, I actually think there's, there's you, can be, you can do the same thing you did 10 years ago. But if you do it better, you're still on the cutting edge. That's that's what I, I kind of look at it. It's not right. like we must move on to a new framework. We must move on to this thing. So just I think that's something that I want to just share when I was listening to you because I think sometimes we just want the new. I'm like, you're yeah. not good at the old. Get like, good at the old, right? So, all right. Well, George, I've seen you, and oh, I've sorry. seen you speak enough too, right? It's like, 
it's like what well, we want our audiences hopefully i mean at least that's how i see it and i've seen you speak enough and i feel like i get that from you or whoever is we're listening to speak people that we respect people who are doing great yes. work in the field right really i truly believe helping people and doing it for the right reasons is i do believe that you know i try to be really honest and say people listen I, i'm not here to tell you what to do that's not my job right, right? Like, i don't even know anything about your community or i really don't um, I'm honored to be here. I'm grateful. But what I'm really going to try to do is hopefully what I share today. One, I hope it validates what you're already doing. I mean, I hope that some of the things I talk about, you can feel good knowing that, yes, I feel like I'm doing some of the right things, especially for those who maybe sometimes don't get a lot of feedback, but it validates the work. I'm hoping that something I share today reminds you what you're currently doing, but what you like is the little bit, how it's a little different. And there's a little twist to it or something a little unique that you can now make a little bit of adjustment that maybe will take you to a little bit, a, a little bit higher level. I'm also hoping that I share something with you today that you go, oh, my God, I hadn't even thought about that. I love that idea. Right. And hopefully you go think about that and reflect on that. But you know what I'm really hoping is that today you're just reminded of the things you already know. But for whatever reason, you're still not doing it or you used to do it and you stopped doing it. And I right. want to reignite that fire in you to go back and go be the person you said you always wanted to be. So. Again, a lot of it, I think I, I find it somewhere in that arena. Right. And that's kind of what you're talking about. Like, hey, are you doing the things that we talk about? You can tell me about the four core principles of culturized, but I'm asking you, what's your framework? Yeah. And are you living your core every day in the classroom or in the building or at the district level? Because if you're not, then why do you want new stuff? Go go get the fundamentals down first. Right. You know, this is a coach. We can go put in all the offenses we want in the world. But if your fundamentals aren't solid, guess what? It won't matter. Will it you know, will not matter. So I think that's what I love about Culturized Morning. It is truly a foundational framework to set the foundation to say you can do so much more if you get your behavior mm -hmm. right and the way it's supposed to be. In other words, what's your leadership language? More importantly, what's your leadership behavior? What does it look like? Show me. So Yeah, and I know that the, the big thing is, you know, like you're here. To, I'm here to share ideas with you, but you got to figure out your solutions because it's your community and you know them best, right? right? So I love that. All right. Last question. So this is written in 2017. It is 2023, you know, and like, you know, I guess it kind of ties into just what we just talked about. Uh, you know, so you're looking at this right now. Why is this book still relevant in 2023, even though it was written six years ago? Yeah, I feel like I kind of, I apologize for that because I feel like I kind of answered that a little bit, but I'll just kind of repeat it one more time is the reason I think it's more relevant or it's just as relevant, I should say, yeah. because I still see culture's behavior. Right. And when you look at the behavior of people in organization, where is it coming from? And so if you think about it this way, right, like like one of the first things I always ask a principal, George, if I'm going to go into work with a principal, I just simply say, let me ask you a question. Just tell me what your vision is for your school. Right. Yeah. And part of it is, is because I want people to recognize that that has to be really clear. Right. And so what I see is they kind of hesitate or they kind of stumble over it a little bit or. I may ask them at the beginning of the day and I'll turn around the next day and I'll ask them again and they'll sound differently. And so one of the things I remind them is, hey, that has to be really clear because you need to keep reminding people what the vision is all the time, right? And so if you think about it this way, the vision is what do you hope to become someday, right? The other one is why do you even exist? What's your purpose? Why do you do, why do, you do what you do, right? And so to see that. But I think the, still as critical, as important as that is, is so talk to me a little bit about what behaviors are going to be required that you and your staff are doing in order to achieve that vision. And so those are the value statements, because to me, values are behaviors. And so how are we going to behave in this organization to achieve that vision? So I think the next step up, George, at least when I work and I notice is that almost, you know, obviously every school is going to have mission statements, vision statements and value statements. But yet you still watch behaviors in the organization that do not align with that. And so I say, let's take it one step further. And so here's where I think you can really move the needle and really take your culture to another level is I want you to think about it this way. Can we predict that right now that George, Jimmy and everybody else on our staff, do you think there will be days when we don't live our core values that we violate those? Do you think there will be days when we get frustrated or we kind of maybe argue with a kid or maybe come across with a parent with a tone or a little bit more emotion than we should. Do you think that will happen eventually? And the answer is always yes, right? You know why? Because we're not perfect beings. So then the question is this, when that happens, my question is this, how are we going to respond when that happens? So if we can predict that's going to happen, why would we wait for that to happen? And then we walk over here and gossip about it or talk about it, but we really aren't doing about it. 
So mm -hmm. let's be a little bit more strategic and let's go ahead and work on our values, but let's take another step further. And now let's have the conversation right here before these, they're like the agreements, right? This is how we're, we're all agreeing we're gonna behave this way, but can mm -hmm. we also all agree that we're gonna violate these values? Of course we are, okay. So how do we create a culture permission then that allows all of us to be great that says, hey, I want George to be great. I want Stephanie to be great, but no one's gonna be able to do that on their own. So when George or Stephanie behave in a way that does not align with our values, then how am I gonna to respond to that? And so if we all agree that the way we would respond is say, hey, George, I get what you're saying, but that doesn't seem like it aligns with our values. Mm -hmm. And so you can go, you know what? I see it. You're right. Okay. And now you say thank you. Because in cultures of permission, it's because everybody wants everybody to be great at what they do. So first, first question about the book, Lead with Appreciation. So obviously 2019, why'd you write, you know, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to do some of these podcasts on these books that were written prior to pandemic and say like, how are they relevant today? So why'd you write this book in the first place? We genuinely felt Melinda and I, and I know I can speak singularly in the same applause for her. Um, there are 5,000 things expected of administrators. Um, they are supposed to encourage and motivate, but hold accountable, but you know, discipline if needed and also teach well, and then make these humans great people. And there's so much pressure on teachers. Um, and principals are the bearer of that. And so it took, and I know that you remember this because I'm sure that we discussed it. It took a good seven months when I became principal before I recognized that when I walked in the room and people nodded their head and smiled and my jokes were funny and my outfits were cute, was it because of my sparkling personality? Uh, it actually was because I was the principal and your position precedes your person every single time. And my love language is gift giving. My love language is gift receiving also. Um, so and I would, <laughs> did you hear that, Michael Demon? Um, I would naturally go above and beyond in certain ways to show appreciation and give. Here's a cute new T-shirt staff, or hey, I'm going to give you a ding dong, and ding dong, the bells rung, everybody's here, let's have some fun. Like all the puns with all the snacks. Until I realized that they didn't necessarily all like, oh, hey, the Amber, like, uh, what? Quit sucking up, quit trying to win us over, quit trying to bribe us, was literally their mentality until they got to know Amber, the person who has been this way her entire life. And so that was a huge turning point for me to recognize that not everybody understands the purpose or the intent when giving and receiving, and that there were other principals who think you get a paycheck what do you want from me? <laughs> like you get compensation for the job you signed up to do. I'm not buying donuts. I'm not going out of my way to solicit fundraisers or donations to be able to fund a luncheon. Um, I don't have time for that because again, of the 5,000 things that they have to do, they just don't, they don't need it. So they don't necessarily know they should give it. So the purpose of the book was not to negate or diminish the importance of academic integrity, because again, my wolves were the brightest and smartest in all of the land. Um, we, we recognize that you have tons of meetings and you've got tons of people to make happy and you've got parents and you've got students. If we can make this one part of your job easier, if we can help you out with the ideas that maybe you're too tired or too stressed or just don't naturally think of, here's an entire book dedicated to getting to know your staff, why it matters, how you can do it. That was, we want to take that one little sliver of what we did, what we know that we both did and help other people with that sliver and this is and now i feel bad because this is like a question that's like because you could get in this a book but I, I now i feel bad what is like one strategy you share in the book that could be helpful to someone listening to this right now okay you don't have to feel bad i mean again, I like i have all like, sorts like, you should read the book though like <laughs> you share something from the book you get it for free right now but you should be at the book and i and i'm not i don't get any money for this either like i just think <laughs> it's a really good book so i just wanted to share that well, thank you. Yeah. I think sometimes when we look at team building or um, culture building in our meetings, we think of like camp kind of activities. And it's so interesting because I've put a lot of stuff out like on, on TikTok or about icebreakers and like beginning of staff meetings and, and what should we do? And there's, I get a lot of feedback. So it's it's all good conversation. I, th I don't mind just throwing right. things out there that might challenge yep. our thinking. Absolutely. But, in the book, um, I actually share an idea that I got from Brene Brown's um, Dare to Lead book, which is identifying our own two core values and doing that collaboratively. 
and I'll just share with you a story from when I did this with my staff. Um, so basically, I on Brene's website, she has a list of 100 core values. And the, the, the practice is you select the ones that speak to you, then whittle it down to 10, whittle it down to five, whittle it down to two. And I, I was listening, re-listening to her book one summer a couple of years ago, and I thought, I don't even know what my core values are. So I'm going to do this exercise myself. And when I did that, the exercise, I identified t- two core values of mine as integrity and making a difference. Mm-hmm. And I thought, gosh, I really think my staff should know that these are my two core values because they, these core values motivate a lot of my behavior. Mm-hmm. But then Brene talks about like, what if the staff knew each other's core values. And she tells a story about her CFO and how he kept questioning her about financial decisions she was making. And he thought, she thought he was like really judgy and didn't trust her. And then they did this exercise and she found out that like financial stability is one of his two core values, which like brilliant that he's her CFO and that's one of his two core values. But she just began to look at his questioning of her in a different light. Like this Mm -hmm. is driven by your core value, not by your judgment of me. And the same thing happened in my staff. So um, we had a staff member who notoriously, and she knew this, um, was it felt a little judgy about like bulletin boards and kind of like the physical displays that would be up in the, the school. Like if I had put a bulletin board up, she would be out there like with a staple remover and a stapler and straightening things up. And, and I was like, finally, I'm like, I'm not even doing bulletin boards because I know I can't yeah. do them good enough. To, to for this particular staff member. But we did this exercise in identifying our core values at the beginning of the year. And one of the core values on Brene's list is beauty. And I thought, who's going to mm. choose beauty as one of their two core values? Like I was a little judgy about that. Right. But this staff member chose beauty as mm. one of her two core values. And the end game there is we started looking at that as a strength of hers and a gift she can provide the school rather than a judgment. So understanding it was more about her and her view of the world than about us. And like she became the head of the beautify Quincy elementary committee. Yes. So that's team building. Mm -hmm. That's understanding each other. That's way better than any kind of camp activity. And of course there has to be a culture of trust and how we did this activity um, with my staff is I, I bought little canvases from the dollar store and, and I bought paint pens and they created just a little piece of artwork. that had their name and their two core values. And I didn't make them stand up in a circle and share their core values with each other because some of them seemed a little bit uncomfortable with it. Like it was a little personal mm-hmm. for them. Mm-hmm. And so um, they were, they just shared them in small groups with their, mm-hmm. their team. So I think we just had to be careful when we're, when we're doing activities like this about how we ask them to share with each other, but yep. it, it was hugely valuable for um, my staff. And I think for any staff. Well, you know, that, that I love that focusing on core values and, you know, really kind of that asset thinking mm-hmm. and developing strengths there. There was a time I was in uh, a school and I remember being there and I, I really, one of the things I always challenge people is to look at things with, fresh eyes, like you've never been there before. And there is in the gymnasium where they'd have, you know, or sorry, the auditorium where they would have big events and things like that. And the whole school go into, there's like a, a, a big portrait. I can't remember what was in the portrait, but what I can remember was the frame was cracked and it was broken. And I'm like, do you understand that every time kids walk into this room or there is this, basically this, portrait that has a giant crack in it it's just like like we just let things kind of go around here right and Mm -hmm. there's there's i you know i i've shared the story before there's a certain sense in um it tells you a lot about a leader if if they if they see a piece of garbage in front of the school and if they walk by it and ignore it or pick it up Mm -hmm. because because it does say something to our community it does say something to our kids that we don't necessarily care enough about this space to you have it look its best. So like that notion of beauty, that's the first thing I thought of was how, what does that say to our kids when we don't really care about the surroundings that they're walking into every single day, as opposed to like, we have a sense of pride because right. this is such a beautiful place. And this is so important on, you know, how we respect, um, you know, the, the area. So I, I just love that when you actually wrote teach like a pirate, like 
what like what inspired you to write it in the first place? Like, why did you get that out to the world? Yeah, so I think what it was, I was doing the workshop for years and years and years. And that's kind of something, um, we've talked about this before, where I started doing the Teach Like a Pirate workshop in about 2005. And then was traveling and on the road with it for years and years and years before actually writing the book. And that is something that I think made a big impact and a big difference. And when I think about innovators mindset, I think about the same thing. Like you were keynoting around these concepts of your book and talking and speaking about it and workshopping and doing all these things for a long time and blogging about it before you drew it into a book. Like, so your message had already been out in front of an authentic audience and you had seen what was relevant and what uh, people were picking up on and liking and able to flesh that out. And that was the same thing with Teach Like a Pirate. I had been speaking about it for years, but I knew that I could only go so many places, hmm. but a book can go everywhere. So if I really wanted to amplify my impact, um, I needed to write the book. And then the other thing is, is that people, uh, when they see, they see a speaker, they get excited and they get pumped up but then they walk out of the room and what's really important is do they implement what they saw? Do they, do they take any of those ideas? Like I, I have a, I say inspiration without implementation is a waste. And so don't just inspire me, change my practice and having somebody be able to watch the keynote or the workshop and then walk away with something in their hands that they're going to be able to go back and use is super important. And I think that's like the same thing is true of your book too. It's like they can see you, they're inspired, but then now they can also like a, a principal can say, I want to, I want my whole staff to read that. I want to implement these ideas. And so that's why I think putting it up to paper is an important step. Let's talk about learner centered innovation. Right, let's do so it. Why? First of all, because we're looking at some like books that are a little bit older. Yeah. Why did you write it? Like, do you even remember that process? Like what even got you to, you know, make that jump from blogging and then actually putting it into a book that you yeah. kind of can never change <laughs> ever. It's there forever. It's there forever, for sure. Forever. Um, well, I mean, I think I never imagined myself as an author, never in a million years. Yeah. And going through the process with you was super empowering. I loved it. I loved being able to think about how to put these ideas together and the reaction of what people got from innovators mindset really inspired me to think about, you know, I had been getting some reaction from my blogs and when we did iMOOC, you know, and I started thinking about, I have ideas that are similar, but different and going yeah. around professional learning about the things I was learning in classrooms as I was doing this work around the country that I thought I started to get the confidence that maybe I could write that and maybe it would be helpful and beneficial. And um, it was a longer journey. I remember writing the table of contents and moving it around a hundred different times and kind of tweaking around the edges. And when I finally just started writing it, um, it, it felt like it was, it was something that would be beneficial for educators. Yeah. And you know, it's kind of weird. Cause like I've written several books and I, like it's still, I still struggle with that term author, like when yeah. people, because it's really you. And I think this is what makes your work so approachable is that it's really you sharing learning right yeah. in that space. And I think both of you kind of that approach, like, Hey, we talk about innovation. This is something we're really passionate about, but we're also not the experts, the experts are in the classrooms. We're just sharing some of our journey right. to hopefully help people uh, uh, along the way. And I think, you know, anyone who's looking to write a book, I think it's really kind of just starting with your learning and it, it makes it a more, much more approachable because it's like, Hey, I can, I can take that or I can modify this. I can change this too. And I think that that's kind of that approach, right? Like that you'd see that. I know you're very responsive to sharing your learning as you go. Well, I think that was a big piece of it. I was like, it was going to be helpful for educators, not because I had all the right answers, mm -hmm. but because I was seeing what was working, what was challenging, what opportunities existed in classrooms and schools and systems around the country. And that learning and being able to see that the themes across those different systems, that's what I thought was going to be something that people could also learn from as I was making sense of not only what was great practice, but what was possible. And especially coming out of this was 2018, 
when I think the book was published. So a lot of the learning was like 15, 16, 17, when technology and going one-to-one was starting to become this big deal. And technology alone, we have talked a lot about this. We knew it was not enough. It had to be much more about why are you using the technology? What are your goals? And how how are we going to really make an impact on learners? Well, you know, when you're saying something, you and I, and it's kind of interesting because you're like, you and I have very similar beliefs, mm-hmm. um, but we have, I would say in some spaces, different approaches. Sure. And in, in, and I, I know, I know I, I wrote about this. I know you've helped me with my stuff and I don't know if you remember this, but when I hired, um, when I was a principal, I hired an assistant principal mm-hmm. who was a little bit of a thorn in my side as a teacher. <laughs> and that was part of the reason I hired her because she would challenge stuff that I would say, but I knew she had the same goals that I did, but she had a different yeah. approach. And that's, that's something that really matters to me is that, um, I wanted to hire, I didn't want to hire a second George, right. right. I wanted to hire someone that had a different way would challenge me on some stuff and would help me grow. And, but also would, and weirdly enough, and I'm sure you understand this too, that some of my staff would be more comfortable connecting with her because of how she approached things. And some mm-hmm. of them would be more comfortable approaching me and vice versa. 